Good morning. You may have noticed that we've had we're getting working through technical stuff, and that's all right because this is all about what God can do, and a God is helping us as we're working all this out together. Thank you for being patient. Uh, I was saying a moment ago that you have been on my mind, and before I talk uh, get started with the sermon today, I want to just share uh, and, and hopefully encourage you a little bit as you're there at home much more than normal. Uh, I don't know what things are like right now with where you are, but I'm believing God that if the strife and you bring in peace, if you are feeling so alone because you're there by yourself, that his presence is just being manifested. I want to encourage your heart to lift up your hearts and trust to him. Remember Jesus said to us, he spoke in, in John 16 verse 33, I believe it is, he said, they're going to be difficult times. Pastor, I'm going to stop you once more. Okay. They're not seeing it, but you're going out. Okay, are you sure you're not? It's up. Okay, well... Again, we come this far by faith, trusting in the Lord and believing Him. So uh, if, you, if you're experiencing glitches out there, you hang in there with us. Uh, we understand and we're working on all that, but God is still good. He cares about you right where you are. Uh, he cares about what your life is like. Uh, and as I was saying, I want to, you to know that you are in His heart. He David declares in Psalm 37, verse 25, that he's, he was young and now he's old, and he had never seen the righteous, excuse me, the light, righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. Paul writes in chapter 4 of Philippians, he says, I've, I've been in abundance, I've been without, and I've learned to be content in whatever state life finds me. Because I can do all things through Christ who enables me. These men both were individuals who experienced great trials and tribulations, ups and downs, but they learned that God will always bring them through. And I want to encourage you with whatever you're experiencing this morning, God is bringing you through. Keep your hope in Him, your trust in Him. He I want you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, you are so good. And we look to you. We acknowledge you in this morning. I ask that, that you would just open our hearts for this time of teaching in your word. I thank you that you will help me to be a conduit that you can flow out of freely and that your presence is not limited to this space, but it's everywhere, everywhere, when people are listening to this broadcast, and when you lead them there, we open our hearts to you, in Jesus' name, amen. Over the past several weeks, I've mentioned on a number of occasions, I've referenced uh, Romans 8.28 as before I again get into it, I just want to make one other uh, brief thought announcement. And that is, and if you have, if you pulled up an outline, in the latter part of the outline, under C, where it talks about valuing the presence, down there where you see 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 19 and 20, my hands or my mind, one of them was working faster than the other, and you'll need to make a correction there. It is actually uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. But as I said, I've referenced Romans 8, 28 on a number of occasions that our God works every circumstance, even the most evil thing that Satan may want to try to do. God has a redemptive plan 
So we understand that in these days that we are walking, he has a redemptive plan. And in the context of that, part of what he is doing, he is changing our perspective, lifting our perspective in a number of ways. Well, he's lifting our perspectives about the way we see ourselves as his children. How we see our relationship. He's lifting our perspective of ourselves. He's deepening our perspective of our relationship with him. He's widening our perspective of our fellow man. As well as really bringing true to our hearts our perspective of our divine calling in this hour. He's making all of these things more clear to us. And one of the things I believe he, that he's doing in this hour, he's also lifting and bringing more clarity to our perspective of why it is we gather together when we're able to gather together again. I want to share with you today from the topic of the sacred place, the sacred place. No, in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, it ushered in a new normal. The full transition from Old Testament living into a New Testament reality. A total paradigm shift. And within the context of that, a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to have sharing with you, I talked to and referenced Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And in that time, again, a circumstance happened, the persecution of the church. And I want to read that uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him, that is Stephen, to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the, the church of Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And as I mentioned to you before, God having a redemptive plan, he used, they were all cloistered there, as it were, in Jerusalem. And God used that moment in time to really launch in a redemptive way the spread of the gospel. So we see that happening there, but it is, again, as we read in verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 4 of that chapter, where it says, as they went, they spread and they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I also want to share another, uh, what I believe is a redemptive purpose of God in that hour. There was a shift from... And I believe it was God's purpose that there would be a shift from a temple focus to living as temples. A shift from the temple focus to living as God's temples. You see, from the time of Moses to Solomon, the Ark of the Covenant, that the Ark of the Covenant was where God decided to cause the abiding manifestation of his presence to be. And from Moses to Solomon, it was the ark was in the tabernacle. And that's where people would come to gather before the tabernacle to encounter God, to encounter his presence, to, to encounter and to see him manifest. Then from Solomon to our Lord Jesus, the ark was set inside the temple of Jerusalem. And it was there again that people came to worship. They offered sacrifices. And they gathered there to experience the abiding presence of the Lord. But Jesus made a promise. Actually, when we look at it historically, because the time I'm talking about from Moses through Solomon up to Jesus was hundreds of hundreds of years that this culture 
of the presence of God being manifest through the ark in a given place. That was the culture. And Jesus makes this radical promise. In John 7, verses 38 through 39, he, he says to them, paraphrasing, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. In John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, he says, and he gives this promise that begins to, even though they didn't fully understand it at that time, change and shift their thinking. They're saying that God was going to bring and send through Jesus his Holy Spirit to be with them, but not only with them, to live in them. Totally unprecedented. He will be with you, and he will be in you. We read in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, the Lord again pressing in this paradigm shift. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In verse 8 of chapter 1 of Acts, but you will receive power. Now, this power that was so resident at the Ark of the Covenant, the power that they took with them as they went over into the Promised Land, the, as they carried the Ark, and the Ark, when they set their feet in the water, because of the presence of the Lord, at flood stage, the Jordan River parted as they went. paradigm, okay? We look at all these hundreds of years. I believe one of the other things that the events of Acts chapter 8 did, I believe that the people there, they were so used to coming you know, to the temple to find God that it took some doing for them to realize that the God, that the presence of God they were looking for was in them. And so in the New Testament church, this radical, amazing promises, promise of Jesus and this paradigm shift represented a new normal for God's people. A new normal that Paul writes about in, chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. He says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Now we know that God's presence fills the whole earth, the whole universe. It fills everything. But what he is telling us, and he told the brothers and sisters then, is that not only is God filling the whole earth, you particularly, he is filling you as his Christ, as a follower of Christ. His presence, the abiding presence, is filling you. First, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul writes, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power of God 
will be of God and not from us. Beloved, we are the sacred place. We have this awesome and glorious power. We have the manifestation of heaven, which is God, living inside of us. The same presence, now listen to me, the same presence that resided in the temple of Jerusalem lives in you. Lives in you. And I believe as the New Testament church, the early church was growing and developing, this shift, this paradigm shift was beginning to ring more and more true in their hearts. I believe that they began to see themselves as Peter talks about, as Peter writes, he says, you are living stones of the house of God. And speaking of Peter, when he encounters uh, the, the man who had been lame from birth, and he let this man ask for alms, and Peter looks at him, and he says, I don't have the money that you're looking for, but such as I have. I believe that this was the revelation in Peter's heart that he had the presence of the living God that supplied an anointing to heal and touch this man's life. And I think that's how the New Testament church uh, just responded to God and how they lived their lives as temples of God that God could be manifest in and manifest in. Through the love. And now here in our day, I believe that in this time, in this moment, at least this time where we are, uh, as it were, the whole normal, even of church, is being shifted. I believe that God is wanting to reshift our perspective. Because I believe that over time, we've kind of our perspective has shifted. And I think he, he wants us to know that we are, again, the temple, that sacred place, not the building. You see, the building, as they did in those days, it was important to gather for teaching and for lifting one another up. But as he did then, he wanted them to know that the, 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 that was what the building was about, but it was not the arrival place. That the gathering of God's people at any facility, is the launching pad. So that we are the temple, not the building. And I believe that over time, as we've built wonderful facilities, and as we've come together, we've kind of adopted the mindset that we've got to come to church to find God. We've got to come to church to experience him. If anything powerful is going to happen, it's going to happen when we gather together in that building and the, we, we put the emphasis on the building as opposed to the reality of the real temple. So what does this mean for us as we are in a time where we have been decentralized or the church as it were, around the nation and the world, within our community here, has been scattered to our home. Well, God's saying, listen, and I know, and I'm, I'm anxious, I'm, I'm looking forward to the time when we can gather together again, but I think Holy Spirit is saying, listen, I want you to gather, but I want you to understand that you are the temple right where you are. And that there's a personal and there's a family altar right there where you are. Right now. Right now, right now, right now, beloved. You don't have to show up at a building. God is right there. And he's not just around you. I want you to see that he is in you. David in Psalm 27, verse 4, he said, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire of him in his temple, to meditate on him. 
Our beloved David was thinking about, and his joy and his desire was going to a place. And what I want you to understand is you are that place. That's why you can have a personal altar right there. And God is drawing us, and he wants you to know right now at home is that personal altar. There's that family altar right there. This is such a wonderful time because you are the temples of God to draw your children in and to, to teach them and let the presence of God that is in you and all around you be manifest in your, your home. As you understand that it's not about the place, it is about the people. You are that place where the grandeur of God, as David so longed for, can be manifest. Personally, and as you gather together as a family. As you look at your neighborhood, right now, you are a move of God. You are. As it was written in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and you shall receive power. There is power resident right now. There is light. Life-given heaven is right there in your neighborhood. Do you know why? You are there and you carry, you are a carrier of the divine presence of God. Bless the name of the Lord. And so it is important that we see ourselves personally, that you see yourself as the church, not the building, that you see yourself as the church, empowered by Holy Spirit, that you bring the living witness of heaven to wherever you are. So that as we reopen our doors, and we pray that that time will be soon, as we reopen our doors, that we come here and we understand that we're coming and this, each time we come, this is the launching pad for what God wants to do, not the arrival place. That we are, we are attending and we're gathering together as a building, but we see ourselves from a, the uh, shift of paradigm from attending the church to being the church. Bless the Lord. But with that said, again, what value is it? What's the value of our coming together to worship? Because um, it might be, as I'm sharing this, and again, we, it's such a blessing to have this technology to be able to come out to you and to share and fellowship and communion. And it's also a convenience. It's an ability to sit there and have conversations. And there's a value of being able to be there right in your home. But with that in mind, why assemble together? What, what's the value of this coming to uh, a building, a facility. And I'm definitely not trying to promote, as I share with you, that uh, we should no longer gather together. In the contrary, we should, but we should have the right perspective as we come together as a launching pad. Well, uh, for one, why should we assemble together? Well, because the Bible instructs us to. In Hebrews chapter 10, Verses 24 and 25, he says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. By the way, it's, you can do that some over the Internet or other media, but face-to-face -face is better. Here's what he instructs us in verse 25. But encouraging one another, okay, as the day draws near, and not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And we need to understand that instruction. Sometimes people kind of mistakenly say, well, the Bible, you know, that was, Paul wrote that so long ago, or the writer of that scripture, he said that, well, 
when God inspired scripture, he inspired it to be timeless. The principles of God's word are timeless. They transcend media, culture, the technology, the ideologies, the, the, the new ways of doing things of our day. His principles still remain the same. And so we do so because God has instructed us to, we, and also because we are God's family. We are God's family. In Psalm 68, verse 6, he says, He has taken us from a solitary life, and he has brought us together as family. In John 1, chapter, uh, John chapter 1, verse 12, in Romans 8, ver, chapter uh, 8, verse 15, in 1 John 3, 1, he talks about in each of those scriptures that we are the family of God. And family, God's family, is always ordained to congregate, to love each other, to give, just to develop relationship, not only with our Heavenly Father, but to, with one another. And I cannot develop a relationship with you very well. I mean, online dating, if it stays online, I guess, what good is it if you don't get to meet a person that you can grow with and share life with? Well, in the body of Christ, the family of God is meant to meet, uh, to meet together. And I am not, by the way, I use that, that just popped into my mind. I am not promoting online get dating. I'm using that as, a, as a, an example. We are created also, another reason is God created us not only as family, but he created us as commu for community. We are created and to be interdependent. And this is not always easy, but we're created and we're best when we're interdependent. Ecclesiastes, paraphrasing Ecclesiastes, you may see it on the, the, uh, the screen, but I'm going to paraphrase it, uh, chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, that we can get more done when we are together. We help each other through our times of struggle. Together, we help each other. An army of believers is better than one of us trying to win the battles of life on our own. We're interdependent because we are the body of Christ. And Paul brings this insight and revelation to, to, full, to full view before us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through and 13. As a matter of fact, if you read through 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you get the, the real picture of how uh, we are so interconnected and interdependent. Paul says that we are hands, arms, and feet, particularly anointed by God. In specific ways, just like my hand, my physical hand, has a particular gifting and skill. My fingers to my arms, but my torso, my brain, my neck, each part of the body, even down to those minute parts that hold us together. Ephesians 4, verse 16, the ligaments, the unseen parts, but all of us play a part, but that part of one oneness is together. Operation is together. If I stay by myself, just viewing the word, just gathering to myself, I am a part of the body that is missing. And when one part of the body is missing, just like when one part is hurting, this is why it's important that we support each other. This is why it's important that we pray for one another in this time. But if I don't see myself as a vital part of the organism called the body of Christ and the importance of us coming together to do the work, come together to learn and be taught, then something's going to be missing. Also, there's such power and anointing when we come together. Leviticus 26, verse 8, talks about uh, that five of us can chase 100, but 100 can chase 10,000. When we come together corporately and pray, 
When we come together, you have an altar. Like I mentioned, I'm saying that you are the temple. And when you worship, the presence of God is manifest in you and through you. But there is this corporate 10,000, 100,000 type of anointing that happens when we come together to worship as well. The other thing is that we grow better together. Spiritual growth and maturity doesn't happen in a vacuum. It does not happen in a vacuum, but it happens in the interaction, in the fellowship, the times when we lift each other up, build each other up. It happens in the times when our imperfections are shown and uh, our, our, uh, we're used to sharpen each other. It happens when we are working through the and growing in the, the character of Christ, the character that produces patience, that produces forbearance, that produces uh, and helps us to forgive. All of this is the process of us growing together. Us growing together. And you cannot grow together alone. So this value is important value to us grow. Uh, us gathering together when we have the right perspective. To have the right perspective of our gathering and what our gathering is meant to do. Again, our gathering is never meant to be the arrival place where we just sit in among ourselves and are never launched as the kingdom of God being manifest to the world. Now, last thing I want to talk with you about today is valuing you are being the temple of God valuing his presence having a welcome a welcoming environment for holy spirit in our heart and through our hearts having a welcome environment for his presence in our home having a welcoming environment in my heart and through that welcoming environment in me as his temple, a welcoming environment in our home. So I want to ask you a question. If we're going to have a welcoming environment, I want to ask you, are, are you distracted? In this time where you're sequestered at home, are you distracted? Uh, um, maybe by the cares of life, but also and I think this, I want to share this, and it's not meant to be harsh, but I, I think it's, um, it's a reality in, in, in us as God's children. Um, so often we are so oblivious, so unaware of God's presence in us, and so uh, ignorant, so ignorant of his presence within us. And during this time, I know we can binge watch on Netflix, or Xfinity, you can uh, have so many other things that are taking your time and your attention. And there's not, listen, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that you are to watch, uh, to take time and enjoy your family and watch television together. But what I am saying that this, this uh, time of quarantine is also a time of divine invitation. And you can spend your time knowing and come out of this time being no more close to God, not knowing his heart anymore, not understanding your assignment and calling in this time than you were when you entered in. Are you letting, even the, I mentioned to you last week when we talked about uh, the ploys of the enemy, even using some of the challenges that you're facing to become a distraction to pull you away from God. So are you distracted? Is your passion for God kind of so-so? I believe this is a time when personally and as a family, the altar of God in our lives is meant to be a flame bright, bright, brighter than the Olympic torch that they light during the Olympic years. Brighter so they can be seen by all the world even from your home. Ask you another question. 
if we're going to be welcoming and having a welcoming environment as God's temple, as a welcoming environment for his presence and through our hearts having a welcoming environment in our home, are you guarding your temple? We have to guard our temple. We have to guard our sacred place. This, and I mentioned earlier correction in Scripture here, not uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, but 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Again, Paul says, again, wake up, come on. Don't you know, realize that you, you, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Jesus purchased you, beloved, with his blood. He purchased the house for God. Okay, Revelations 5, 9, I believe it is. He purchased men for God with his blood. For you have been bought with a price, Verse 20, now here we go. Therefore, glorify God in your body or your temple, your sacred place. Proverbs 4, 23, watch over your heart with all diligence, from, for from it flow the springs of life. Ephesians 4, 30, do not grieve, sadden, the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So I mentioned about being distracted. And again, letting this be a focused time where not that you don't enjoy other things, but also that you let Holy Spirit that is in you, who is wooing you, don't be so oblivious that you've kind of put a cap on it. You cannot even sense God wooing your heart. Don't get so distracted that you cannot sense this loving presence that is in you. But ask him to awaken it, awaken it. My beloved is mine and I am his. He is welcoming me to his banqueting table and his banner over me is love. Song of Solomon. But also recognize that if the temple, if you do not allow Holy Spirit to keep the temple consecrated, if we are making choices that kind of pollute our temple, you see, what we see, what we hear, what we say, what we are involved in right now, it influences it can quench Holy Spirit that is within you. And if you're quenching Holy Spirit who is within you, be it known that you're going to be quenching Holy Spirit. You're going to be offending. You're going to be saddening and grieving Holy Spirit who's around you. As it were, not that God can be squished in any way, never. But he withdraws where there's not that, that intentional purpose to just receive all of him. Uh, when you're watching, I mean, that can come in any number of ways, beloved, because, for example, sometimes with good intention, we'll, we're, we're watching so much news right now. But, you know, I mentioned this before. When have you watched enough to be informed and now what you're watching is becoming a part of you? Some of you are dealing with fear, and that's because you're hearing and talking about fear all day long or discouragement, because these can be discouraging times. Some of you, I've heard, I mentioned was watching a program, and I mentioned that right now alcohol sales are up through a, a high percentage. Pornography, the websites that purvey things like pornography are up. But even there, with, again, with what you're watching, let be sensitive to Holy Spirit, not just those things that are just obvious, but be sensitive to Holy Spirit so that you do not quench. You said, I can't, I can't feel God. I, I don't sense him. I'm even praying and nothing's happening. Well, 
let him examine you. Are there some things you're letting in that are grieving him? And therefore, uh, there's this strife manifesting your home. Maybe it's because you're letting strife in through the media. I'm not saying these things to be harsh. I want you, my last point, to experience the Obed-Edom effect. What am I saying? Well, uh, I'm talking about the impact of having a welcoming atmosphere, a welcoming heart to God's presence. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, the back story, uh, uh, because of uh, of Israel's sin, the ark, the, 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 the abiding place of God's presence, had been captured by their enemies. And so, in a technical way, they were living without the true manifestation of all the blessings, all the goodness, all the experience of God that come with his abiding presence. And so David captures the ark, but he forgot. And again, welcoming, how we welcome the presence of God is so important. And he had not welcomed it right. He put the ark on the, an ox cart, and you may know the story how uh, Uzzah touched it in a, a well-meaning way, but because things are out of order, Uzzah died. And so David was discouraged, and he chapter, uh, in, in chapter 6, verse 10, it says, David was unwilling to move the ark of the Lord into the city of David with him because of that incident. He just was shaken up. But he, David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. That's the ark of the Lord, the abiding presence of God remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. Now get this. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And when David heard about it, verse 12, now it was told to to King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark, on the account of the abiding presence of God being welcomed, Obed-Edom was blessed. And I want to encourage you today, beloved, as I am closing again, you are that we kind of let Holy Spirit reshift our thinking. That we allow Holy Spirit to open up to us the revelation of the revolutionary context of the New Testament church, that the abiding presence of the living God who fills the universe has taken up residence inside of us. And all that represents, the blessing of that individually, the blessing of that in the places we abide and how it can extend out to our neighborhoods is there. The Obed-Edom effect, everything, all of a sudden, I don't know what Obed-Edom's life was like before that day, But when he welcomed the presence of God into his home, everything changed. His livestock became more productive. His crops grew to such an abundance that he had never seen before. His family, his children were blessed beyond what even they could have imagined. Um, it, it just the blessing of God rested out of nowhere as he welcomed the presence of God. Health, and most of all, revelation of relationship. Well, I believe, I know within my heart, in this hour that God is saying, I want you to experience the full effect of my abiding presence within you. And if you will welcome me, just welcome me, just letting me come in and just 
being conscious of me and then allowing me again to come inside. I want you to pray, but also I want you to seek me. I want you to come into fellowship. But as a result, you maybe you've been re- experienced strife in your home right now. Maybe you had a place of want. I'm telling you, I believe it, that right now as you let Holy Spirit come in, as you welcome him both within you, uh, the manifestation in your heart and in your home, that sacred place you I believe peace is going to begin just by the authority of the presence of God. Peace, health, wellness, joy, security. Maybe you just got news that, again, you've been laid off or you had the prospect, beloved, who, of some of you who are working at Penn State. Just embrace the presence. Because it says, my God shall supply. The blessing of welcoming the present into the sacred place. I encourage you to do that today. As I close, I believe, I believe, I believe that there's a greater revelation of what it means for you to house within yourself the abiding presence of God. Housing it in you and then letting it be manifest in your home so that your personal and family altar is blessed and built. And let it be manifest around your community, even if you're just riding down your street in your car. Bless you today, beloved. Now, uh, we've had some challenges today, but, you know, (laughs) I, I am not daunted. Because, you know, it's not what I hope Holy Spirit is giving you. It's really not based on my ability, how well I talk or articulate. Even the points I make. I am praying that right now, or how well we are technically at any given moment, how well we sing or do all of that. It is the presence of the living God who is right there in you. Holy Spirit Bring revelation right now of your presence that we are your sacred place and really what that means for our individual lives, what that means in the strategic places where we live and that you have placed us, what it means for the neighbors and people around us that we carry the abiding presence. What it means is we stand against the forces of hell. What it means is we commune and worship with you. Open our eyes. Show us what it means that to be carrying the presence of God, that we're not coming to church anymore to find you. Oh, Father, make this real. That we're not coming to church to find you to get lifted up by you, that we're bringing you with us. We're bringing the glory with us. We're bringing the manifestation with us. And when we come together, there's a wonderful explosion of you, not something where we come to get you, to come. we're coming to bring you into the house as we're being taught and as we're being built up. Now, Father, there's someone also, uh, I, I, again, as I pray this, I also know that there may be someone today who, Uh, does not know you. They don't know your love and your grace, but I pray wonderfully that you would meet them. I pray wonderfully right now, Holy Spirit, you you are around. You're not in that person who doesn't know you yet, Lord Jesus, but you're all around them. Your love is toward them. Your heart is passionately for them. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that, that God, the God we're talking about, we're worshiping, he is real. He is real and he loves you. And you don't have to get yourself together. He did it all. Jesus did it for you that you might just receive. Would you just pray this with me? Dear Jesus, right now I recognize I need you in my life. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. If you've asked that 
that wonderful thing. You now have become that temple. All of you who are, are those sacred places, all the believers, would you say this with me right now? Dear, dear Lord, I thank you for your presence, the glorious presence that filled the tabernacle, that filled the temple in Jerusalem, that glorious, awesome presence. I thank you that your presence is inside of me. I receive and I believe and I thank you for showing me what that looks like in my daily living. Showing me what it looks like as I am a carrier of your presence. I am a sacred place. Show me what that looks like in my home, in my personal and family altar, in my life, going out and forward. In Jesus' name, God bless you today. Thank you for hanging in there with us today. I pray that you've been blessed or that you will be blessed as you uh, watch this. And I want to again thank you for just your continued prayer support. I want you to continue to pray about all this that's going on in our world right now. And I also want to thank you for your continued support of the ministry here. I thank you that you, God has given you a generous heart and that you will let him lead you in your giving and your tithing and that you will remain faithful. Again, faithfulness is not dictated by being in the building. Faithfulness is dictated by our relationship with our Heavenly Father. So I thank you for honoring him with your giving. I bless you in this week, Temple of God. I bless you in your going and your coming and all the ways that God is going to stir himself within you and manifest himself through you. God bless you in Jesus' name. Unity Church of Jesus Christ will celebrate communion together next Sunday, May 3rd, during our live streaming service. If you don't have the elements already on your next shopping trip, you could purchase some grape juice and matzo crackers or saltines from the store. Please do not make an extra trip out to purchase communion elements. It is important that we do our best to comply with Governor Wolf's instructions that we only go out for essential needs. If necessary, use water and bread. The Lord will honor your heart. Be sure to send an email to ucjcprayer at gmail.com with your questions, special needs, and prayer requests. Our intercessors and pastors will be happy to pray with you, respond to questions, and lift up your requests. And once you've made a decision to draw closer to God, be sure to let us know at this address so that we can welcome you into the family. Join us online every Wednesday night at 6.30 for The Encounter. It's a time of praise, worship, and prayer. Tabernacle in your home. Go to the UCJC Facebook page, and it will be a Facebook Live event. Click on Like the page and follow. Select the post for the Facebook Live Wednesday Encounter Prayer. You can click Get Reminder to be notified before future encounters. Feel free to click on Watch Party to share the prayer event on your personal Facebook page. To give to Unity Church of Jesus Christ via online giving, go to the ucjc.org website and click on the Give Today link. Please have your credit or debit card or your ACH bank account information ready. You can mail your tithes and offerings to Unity Church of Jesus Christ at 2280 Commercial Boulevard, State College, Pennsylvania, 16801. Please mail it to the attention of the treasurer. To stay in touch with Unity through social media, you can find us on Twitter by opening the Twitter app and searching for at UCJCNPA. Click on follow. In the Instagram app, also search for at UCJCNPA and click on follow.